Today I'm talking breeding and genetics with the one and only Rasta Jeff. We'll be covering some of his famous strains, the Lemon Jeffrey, the Orange Gasm, Arise, and we'll also be talking about that classic strain, Golden Goat, that finds its way into a lot of his work. Old genetics, European genetics, best breeding practices, and a cool conversation. That's what you're in store for today. So let's go. Yes, uh, you. That's the that's the most info I've given on a podcast. Is the that, those details right there? So it's like that's just a big red flag. That's the biggest red flag. Yeah, that's um, that's a really good question. Nobody's ever given me the opportunity to ramble about that, so I love it. Welcome back, everybody, to another episode of the Breeding and Genetics Show. And I've got a really fun guest, very cool dude with me today. He is the founder of Irie Genetics and also the Grow From Your Heart podcast. Mr. Rasta Jeff, how are you doing today? I'm great, brother. I'm great. Thanks for having me. It sounds like we're both stoned today. We are. We are. It is. Well, it's a little bit past 420, but I'm sure it's 420 somewhere. And uh, yeah, we, we started off in, you know, break a little bread before we before we do the show of course. yes yes welcoming ceremonies if you will yes well it, you know it, it's kind of wild too and i have grown your genetics and i will definitely ask about that but it's wild the amount of people that i have know that have grown your genetics and i've always been really impressed with the results lemon jeffrey is one of those strains that it's been around for a long time and it's even in dispensaries so I was kind of curious on that one. Um, you know, could you maybe tell me a little bit more about Lemon Jeffrey, oh, like yeah. what the cross is? But oh, yeah. also uh, too, I'm really curious what your thoughts are when you see your own stuff in like retail stores. Yeah, that's um, that's a really good question. Nobody's ever given me the opportunity to ramble about that. So I love it. Uh, we'll start talking about the strain. Uh, Lemon Jeffrey, that is a, a lemon skunk from Greenhouse Seed Company. A long time ago, I was gifted some greenhouse seeds and lemon skunk was in the mix. And it got my attention, so I grew it. I found an amazing plant. Uh, she grows a little stretchy. Um, the internodal spacing is quite stretchy, but that all fills in with giant buds at the end. She's got a soft, it's not that um, offensive lemon. It's not like a, a, an astringent ammonia lemon. It's more like a soft country time lemonade, sort of a candy lemon sort of thing, and I love it. So I took that uh, lemon skunk and I bred it to the golden goat. I reversed the world famous, super popular golden goat, one of my favorite cuts ever. Um, and then I took that pollen and put it on the reverse or on the lemon skunk and that made the lemon Jeffrey seeds. Um, my, I have a friend whose last name might be lemon and my name is Jeffrey. So we were in the room together smoking it and it was lemony and I wanted to put my name on it somehow. That was the Irie lemons, the something lemon Irie, why not lemon Jeffrey? And that's kind of how that became. So my buddy's got lemon in his name. I got Jeffrey in my name. That's the lemon Jeffrey. Um, yeah. Cool seeing it in dispensaries blows my mind it's really i started making seeds because i operated a dispensary and people would come in and they would say this particular strain works great for me how do i get a plant and i would feel bad that i might not have the plant or they may be in an area where i can't get them a plant so i started making seeds basically so everybody could have access to these quality seeds and now to see strains that i made in a little town in colorado in a basement are now in dispensaries. I've seen Lemon Jeffrey in Massachusetts and California. Uh, it's in both coasts. And it's it's amazing that people are they have access to the medicine that works for me. That Lemon Jeff works. Uh, I'm a recreational smoker 90% of the time. 10% of my smoking is medical. That Lemon Jeffrey hits my medical need perfectly. Uh, and it's so nice to see that other people are able to have that access and that relief. Was that kind of the plant where you connected maybe the medical aspect of it? Where you all of a sudden you found uh, that one or was this kind of a long thing coming for you? Uh, I, like I said, I worked in a, I had the friends of mine and I had the first medical cannabis dispensary in the city of Pueblo here in Colorado in 2008. So I got to, um, I didn't realize I was using medical marijuana. I thought I was a pothead, but then I realized that <laughs> like, the effects it gives me are they medicate medicates me it is medical cannabis to me i i'm like i said i'm a recreational smoker but there are medical benefits i receive but being at that dispensary i saw people our age i saw people way younger and way older and they would come in with conditions anything from like cancer cachexia 
or maybe even HIV and AIDS to there was a patient we had who had been burned in a fire and he was, uh, I don't know the politically correct word, he was disfigured. He looked, he was scary. And it took me some time to look at him, but seeing what the different strains were doing for all of these people, uh, that it just, it made something feel good. Like people would come in and I could take time with this little old lady and say, Carol, smoke these three strains, come back next week and we'll sell you the one that you like. And she'd come back and tell me, I really like this one. Just building that relationship with the the patients and seeing what different strains did for them. We were improving the quality of their life with cannabis. And that felt amazing. Well, I, I, I don't know which came first, the chicken or the egg, but the Grow From Your Heart podcast, that name is perfect because that is growing from your heart. That's, you know, seeing the potential for others and taking the time to. So I, I didn't know you had the dispensary back in 2008 and hats off to that. Um, I've right. worked retail as well. And that's an important aspect that sometimes gets looked over. So yes. applaud you yes. for that. Thank you. Brother. Thank you. Yeah. And, and I kind of, you know, I came or you came to my attention years ago with the DGC, um, the Do Grow Show. And I saw you, you know, doing a lot there. I got familiar with some of the genetics. And and I, I can't remember. So Arise was used in the Lemon Sunrise, which is one that I grew out. But I yeah. always remember you talking about a stud male and like learning from you talking about how the male you had, you kind of could figure out and go different directions with it. So maybe right. if you could explain a little bit about that to people out there who haven't thought that deeply on males yeah. before. Um, so the, if you're breeding, you're probably most likely going to use multiple females in the breeding project. You're going to have, uh, perhaps you've got a strawberry, a lemon, a gas. Everybody's got a gas. Hopefully you got garlic. Uh, hopefully you got a diesel or something in the mix. So you've got all these females with all these different opportunities. The male plant is only 50% of the equation. So I feel like I want a male that's going to blend well with strawberry, blend well with lemon, chocolate, gas, fuel. So I look, I think of it kind of like chefing. It's like I'm mixing ingredients. And I, if I want savory, then I need savory ingredients. If I want sweet, I need sweet ingredients. Um, I was really lucky to find that King Solomon male because he bred well with everything. <clears throat> Most plants don't have a real problem, but Solomon was the fixer. Um, if your plant didn't grow fast enough, Solomon made it grow faster. If it didn't have a good structure, Solomon gave it a better structure. Uh, King Solomon was what I called my Arise F1 male. It was King Solomon. That's uh, some Rasta stuff in there. King Solomon had uh, many children. His weakness was women. Uh, he was blessed, but had his weakness was women. So King Solomon, I bred him to everything. He's got progeny everywhere, <laughs> how that goes. Uh, but yeah, so I found this dude that just breeds well with everything. And what I like to do is use that male and then if you hit multiple different females, like I said, strawberry, lemons, chocolate, uh, if I just bred the one male to strawberry, we would know that we get some strawberry phenotypes, some arise phenotypes, and some in the middle. That's all we really know. We know what that one cross does. But by breeding it to lemons and chocolate and gas, I got to see how he interacted with those different ladies and see which traits he definitely does pass through through multiple different breeding projects. So I got to see how he interacts with the grape or the gas and saw what he's actually doing across multiple different breeding runs. So I really got a good relationship with that plant. And that's excellent because that, you know, you've used with a variety of plants, as you were saying, but has that helped shaped maybe where you're going with certain projects? Oh, yeah. Like you get, you know, I, I'm a music guy. So if I hear one song, a DJ, I'm like, oh, I've got to mix it with this. Like right. those yeah. two yeah. for each other. I, like I said, he's the fixer. So if you're like, man, I've got this one plant, but it just begs the Mac. Mac one is the perfect example. Everybody loves the Mac. It's a nine out of a 10. It just veges so slow that you have to veg it a month earlier than everybody else to get something out of it. So I pollinated it with a rise. And now the veg time is right where you want it. And it's still the quality and potency that the Mac used to be. It comes out Mac with a little bit of sweet um, vanilla flavor on top of it, like a little hint of vanilla sweetness. So yeah, it's like the fixer. And I can see um at this plant the structure is too stretchy i can hit it with solomon it'll kind of tighten up those node spacing uh, if it takes too long to flower hit it with solomon it'll kind of shorten that flowering time but knowing that male uh, does i can very greatly predict the outcome of many of the phenotypes from the crosses because i know that male so well um i've bred him to i don't want to exaggerate somewhere between 100 and 200 different females and i've grown all of them out and so many other people have grown them and I want to say 75% of the time, my predictions are spot on. As a breeder, some of my predictions are going to be off. That's just how it goes. 
Uh, you can't throw two things together and get it right every time. But with King Solomon, I've got a pretty good eye for what I'm going to do with him just because I've done it so many times. That's awesome. And and have you done any reversing work with some of those like offspring or even just Arise itself? And are you getting a, a similar plant or do you get variations? So I used the cream in a reversal. Um, I made some big mountain fudge cake feminized seeds. Um, that's got the cream and a chocolate in there. The Arise does show up, but I feel like once I do the reversals, I kind of lock in what the reverse plant is more than bringing back the parents, but he does pop up. Uh, that potency, a lot of the potency in my lines comes, it starts with King Solomon. That's where the root of it is. Uh, there's a golden goat is one of the parents of King Solomon and an OG Kush name is Joseph OG is the other parent. And something about putting that uh, really sativa style plant. I know those words don't count anymore, but that's what we used back in the day. That sativa, the thin leaf drug plant with that broad leaf indica variety. When I cross those, it unlocks something brand new because they were so far apart in traits that right. it just opened up this brand new, like a ma it was a magic trick. And I unlocked something super cool with that. I feel very blessed and lucky. I ran through a ton of seeds to find it. I do still feel like I hit the lottery with that guy. Nice. And it's, you know, it's that hybrid vigor. And and, and yeah. I ask because I'm, I'm playing with reversals myself and I've run 20 out. I've got some out to other people, but I didn't get the plant that I reversed. I was kind of expecting wow. to get something and I got, you know, I got some of its hints. Like I know where the gas came from because there were three of them in there that were just nothing but gas, but it was a little unexpected. So I always like to ask people, you know, like yourself with plenty yeah. of experience. <laughs> what? So that, that makes me wonder, like if your starter plant, was it an F1 or an F2? I wonder if filial generation is playing into that because uh, most of the time I'm reversing F1s. And uh, if I ask, if I self an S1 or an F1, it usually comes out with a lot of phenotypes looking just like mommy. But most of the time, mine are F1s. I wonder if you did an F2 or something and that changed a variable in there. That may have unlocked a recessive gene. You may have opened up a whole brand new Pandora's box. You just opened up a Pandora's box in my brain. So yes, I, I will be pondering this one a lot, a lot later. I'll be like, okay, new possibility. I'm glad I asked. Where did, where did your plant start? This might be the next thing to go back, keep going backwards. Yeah. Awesome. Well, another one of that is, you know, infinitely popular with people is orange gasm. And oh, yeah. That one, you know, we, we, we just mentioned, you know, the sativa really should be out the window. But for the sake of classification and conversation, it, it's it's easy. Unfortunately, we're saying yeah. cannabis now, at least. So we'll, we'll move past it at one point. But that one tends to leave orange gasm tends to leave kind of heavily sativa. Do you oh, yeah. have a, a, a preference? And is there anything different in breeding something that's so long flowering other than you have to get your food right? Right. Oh, yeah. You got to get the food right from day one. Um, I prefer the sativa buzz. If I walk into Target and I'm not full on freaking out, I got to go back out to the car and try again. Like, uh, yeah, I need, if I can look you in the eye when we're talking, I might not be high enough. You know, I like that like, oh shit feeling. Like I want to lose my keys while I'm driving my car. That's the kind of <laughs> stone I like to get. Yeah, so I love awesome. sativa dominant all the way. I do have some indica sort of stuff. Uh, some more, uh, I've got the dark hollow, it's a GMO cross. And there may be some skunk breeding happening that I'm not supposed to say out loud on podcasts, but I own the company, so I can leak that stuff. Um, but yeah, I love if, yeah, if I want to call my mom and be like, help, that's how I know I'm in the right zone smoking. That's what I like. That's awesome. Well, I, I, that begs the question then for, for your like ultimate freakouts, whether it's your strains or someone else's, what do you go for? Maybe a couple just like, yeah. I want to have a bad time tonight. <laughs> Uh, Jack Tripper. Um, it's Lemon Skunk, the Lemon Skunk we've talked about, to Jack the Ripper. Um, it's got that lemon terpenaline sort of buzz. It tastes like uh, spicy lemon dryer sheets. And the buzz is unstoppable. You Sometimes if you get too high, you can eat and you'll be okay. Eating doesn't, it doesn't care. You just, it just goes, I ground up the food, now what? And there's no ceiling. So if you feel like this is as high as you can get, you can get up here with that one. Uh, that's the Jack Tripper. One that I haven't released publicly, maybe some friends have it. Uh, should I even say this out loud? Wow, the Congo to Jack the Ripper, the uh, Roberts Creek Vision Maker Congolese cut to the Jack the Ripper uh, that splits your head open and pulls out your brain and spins it around. Uh, you know the girls on spring break? I don't drink anymore, but the girls that would pour tequila down your face and 
blow a whistle at you and rub your face in their boobs and make you feel discombobulated. That's what it's like when you take a dab of this stuff. You, you hold onto the table thinking, oh, where did we go? But you feel like you're getting pulled over and you're just sitting at your desk. <laughs> I'm not even moving, man. Yeah, that's what it's like. Yeah, yeah. I love that sort of buzz. That's what I'm here for. So the, you know, I mentioned the lemon sunrise, which I grew out and I believe that was the lemon Jeffrey times a rise. Uh, yes. And that thing, the, the vigor was incredible. Like it, it took over my small tent. I was like, holy cow, this thing is awesome. And I'm like, if I ever go outside, these are the first things in the ground. Oh, yeah. yeah, they will kill it outside too. Those plants will love outdoors. Yeah. Do, do you see, um, do you see a lot of extended height or, you know, you mentioned that larger internodal spacing, but it fills with flower at the end. So we don't really mind, do we? Right. Yeah. Yeah. That's worth it. Uh, a rise makes things tall. A rise makes big plants. I say he's got hyper vigor. Um, a lot of my crosses take 70 days, maybe 77 days to finish. And people get skeptical. They're like, that's a long flowering time. But then when I say cut 14 days off your veg phase, you'll be just fine. Uh, they still end up with just as big of plants, just as large a harvest. So it could save you two weeks on the veg time and just pull that off on the back end and you'll be just fine. But yeah, big plants, giant tall plants from a lot of the stuff I breed is real tall. And that's, you know, that was a really good tip too, because sometimes, and it was my mistake because I let it get to the, you know, the normal height that I have, you know, my shorter like indica type plants or the bushier type plants. And then I flipped to flower and I was like, holy cow. But as you just mentioned, vegging for a little bit shorter and then flowering uh you're still gonna wind up so it's just kind of knowing the strains i guess right yeah and i've been putting that on the new packaging uh, i've got new packaging that i update my packaging frequently i try uh new department of agriculture laws and just details and just ideas but i've been putting expect tall plants on the package because i've been saying it for years uh my plants get tall and they eat a lot and then people message me like, hey, should this plant get this tall? And I'm like, yes, I've, I've been saying it, bro. I don't think you're like, you're thinking it's going to get tall. I mean, tall, tall. Like I'm six five, and I'm saying it's going to get tall. That's what I mean. <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, that's, I mean, definitely good to know. And that's another thing I love about, you know, attention to detail with breeders. A, you know, actually running their own gear, which is important. And I know you do that. And you also send out a lot of testers. But oh, yeah. being able to relay that information to people and aside from, you know, maybe the pack, is there any other places where they can find some of the information specific oh, man. about strains? You were, you were just setting me up for a home run right now, my dude. Um, I've got a wonderful Discord community. Um, it's the Irie Army Discord. You'd have to contact me to get a link uh, because it's like random letters, but I can send you a link to it. Uh, the Discord is a great community. I've got um, all the strains are listed on the side chat on the Discord, so you can click on each strain and see other people's grow reports and see their photos. And then I actually comment in there too. I'm like, feed it more nitrogen or put in a trellis or whatever it needs, you know? So I'm in there commenting as well. Every strain should be listed. If it's not, let me know, let someone know, and an admin will create a tab for it. Uh, so you can see all the previous grows. And then there is a chat in there called the Smokers Lounge. It's a live chat. It's a video chat. And there are probably 10 to 12 people in there right now hanging out smoking. And if anybody pops in there and says, hey, has anybody grown this strain? Somebody in the room has, and they can help you. And uh, I'm there way too much. I shouldn't admit how much of time I spend on my Discord, but I'm in there a lot. And I'm happy to talk about my strains and my plants, and I love it. So if you want to come hang out, the Discord is a beautiful community. It's a great place to learn about all the strains. And of course, iregenetics.com has a genetics tab that is under construction. Um, I had recently had some hurdles to deal with, and one of those hurdles was editing every single strain on the website. And I think there were 120 listed. I'm more than halfway through, but I'm doing each one individually, and that's taking a little bit of time. Uh, but once I'm satisfied with it, I'm, I'm a perfectionist. Once I'm satisfied, I'll put that strain tab back up, and then every strain should be listed with a lot of details. Some, some details I have to remove just for some uh, weird safety reasons and things, but uh, I'm trying to put as much info as I can and still I'm trying to skirt that line to be honest with you. I 100% understand like I, as much as I'd love to put your uh, Irie Genetics link in the show notes, I can't. Yep. <laughs> I've recently exactly. done that and got no node for it. So um, <clears throat> you guys heard it here, iregenetics.com. Um, <laughs> You can say it. Um, just don't put it in your show notes, folks. <laughs> Very true. Yeah, the, the internet doesn't, uh, social media doesn't like uh, me. They don't like my cannabis posting and my, uh, that I speak up and that I don't let them bully us. Social media doesn't like that. So I'm just going to play by their rules and try to keep my accounts.
Yep. Not a bad thing, especially for the amount of information that you give out. You know, it's you give out all kinds of information, not just the breeding, but the growing. And then also just like you said, with the discord, such an invaluable resource to be able to tap into a group of people because we collectively can share knowledge. We could never like condense 10 years of growing for like a tent grower into what, six months? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, we get new growers in there all the time. There's a new guy now. Uh, there's always one new young guy in there. And when he came in four or five days ago, his head was exploding every time we spoke. I know I see him writing things down. He's like, say that one more time. And I can see his hand over here going, you know what I mean? And now he, nice. he talks like he knows what he's talking about now. He's only been there for maybe a week, but his terminology has changed. His understanding has changed. It's like he's getting a college course, just hanging out with us. And that's and a big have, part of it. Terminology. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, just so that you can actually understand and connect with us. Yeah, and he's, he's catching on quickly. We've got guys from Hawaii. There's a guy from Guam. Uh, there's people from Maine. Uh, there's people from Missouri. We got everybody hanging out in there. It's a really good time on Discord. So you get different environments. Like the guys in Hawaii are growing in a way different atmosphere than my friends in Maine and myself here in Colorado. So we get to learn so many different things. It's really interesting. I always try to remember to start every answer with, it depends. Because oh, yeah. again, I'm I'm an indoor tent grower with a particular climate, and you ask me, and they're like, "No, bro, I grow outdoors." Okay, then. Yep. So that that changes my answer. It, it starts with it depends. Yes. Um, on that tip, though, I know you have some excellent cultivars for outdoors. Do you also have things that are great for a tent grower indoors? What, what oh, would uh, oh. they? What should they look at in the catalog? Uh, right now, you can grow. So we may have scared people away from the orange gasm, saying that it gets so, so tall. You can grow all that stuff in a tent. Just don't veg as long. Just veg them shorter. Do more plants. Veg them shorter. Bang them out. But if you really want to focus on that tent and knock it out, I really recommend the bubble goat, which is Indiana bubble gum to the golden goat. Uh, you can't go wrong. Two, two amazing strains. It tastes exactly like what it sounds like when you say it out loud. If you've ever smoked bubble gum, you get that uh, it's got a bubble gum with a hint of gas, just a light, light hint of skunky gas in the exhale. And then the golden goat is always sweet. So it just comes out this sweet bubble gum, strawberry. I don't know. It's so delicious. It's like almost strawberry milk flavors. Uh, and it's super easy to grow. You can't mess up the bubble goat. It grows. You can kick it over. You can forget about it. You'll have weed in 60 days. Don't worry. It's going to be just fine. Uh, the other one I recommend, if you want a buzz that might make you call your parents and ask for help, uh, Nuketown is amazing. Uh, that is Chernobyl crossed to the golden goat. Uh, okay. And it's, yeah, it'll, it's, it'll blow your brain apart. I love it. Really, uh, really crazy head buzz, vigorous grower. And it doesn't get too tall. It kind of branches out more. Uh, the bottom branches, most of the time you got those bottoms that you cut off because they're chasing the tops. These bottoms meet the top. They're trying to compete. And then something uh, that um, Chernobyl cut that I used, normally we get like a branch with a couple of shoots. Well, those shoots make extra shoots coming off of that Chernobyl plant, and that comes out in some of the phenotypes in the Nuketown cross. Yeah. Shout out to uh, my friend Tanasi for passing me an amazing uh, Chernobyl cut. That is excellent. When I uh, grew commercially, our uh, <laughs> the facility was right across the street from a um, non-working nuclear power plant, and oh, growing cool. Chernobyl was just like the joke. So, yeah, yeah. It's like we, we had the real Chernobyl <laughs> yeah. there. The only one's close enough to radiation to call it the real Chernobyl. Well, Nuketown is, uh, Nuketown's a uh, map and a video game. Uh, and the video, the level has been hit with a nuclear bomb is the, the play on the, the map there. So Nuketown, all the video game nerds know what I'm talking about. And I, I tried to capitalize on that one. <laughs> I, I sadly do not get the reference, but that's okay. That's I'm fine. sure there's a lot of people that watching that not. do. Yeah, that means you're productive. <laughs> <laughs> I try. Oh shoot, I try. Oh man. All right. So, um, okay. Golden goat. We have mentioned this a few times. Um, just kind of worked with that in a lot of crosses. And this is one that when I think about, you know, strands, I'm like, oh, that's on the older scale of things. Right. Um, yes. Where Where did you know golden goat come into your life? And maybe what What about it? Were you like, dude, this is this is um, the one I'm keeping. The cut was super popular. I got it approximately, I want to say 2009, 2010-ish. There's Those years are fuzzy, dude. It was a lot of medical marijuana <laughs> happening and a lot of things all at once. So um, there was a dispensary in Denver, is a dispensary in Denver called Kind Love, and they had Golden Goat, and everybody was raving over it. Um, 
It was in personal grows. It was in commercial grows. Everybody was growing Kush. Like every, it was OG Kush season. And so when the Golden Goat came out, it was the opposite. And I was almost burned out on OG Kush at the time. It was like, you can only smoke so much OG before you, like you get strain lock. I got bored. And so the Golden Goat made, the OG made my eyes heavy and had me lazy. When I hit the Golden Goat, my eyes went, let's do work. And I was like, oh, I like this feeling. It was like coffee and stoned at the same time. So it was such a huge change. Then a friend of mine um, got a clone of the Golden Goat from another friend. We had a friend, um, well, a connection because me and this guy didn't, we didn't fight. We just would rather not be in the same room. He was, he was just yeah. a different kind of person than me. I'd rather just leave when he's there. He felt the same. He got the clone from Kind Love and gave it to my friend who I call Pineapple Express. He's from Hawaii. He got the nickname Pineapple Express. Pineapple Express said, hey, that guy that doesn't like you got this clone. And the first thing he said was, don't give it to you. So ta-da, here's a clone. That's how this industry works. If you tell somebody don't give out a clone, they're in there cutting clones the minute you say, oh, I'm not supposed to share it. Snip, 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 snip. Yeah. So he said, don't give Ross to Jeff a clone. And my buddy Hope Pineapple Express was like, okay. Five days later, I had a beautiful cut. Um, I grew it and took pictures of it. And those were some of the first pictures I ever posted to social media of my plants and my grow. The golden goat was one of the first plants I ever took pictures of. And that was when I posted it, people were like, I want those seeds. I need those seeds. Like it sucks that people wow. in Colorado have that plant and we can't get it. And like I said, <laughs> a moment ago, that's kind of what inspired me to make golden goat fem seeds. That's what started that revolution. I felt that it was unfair. Like people, there are people with cancer everywhere. Why do we have golden goat here? You know, so let's put the golden goat where the people with cancer are. And so that was kind of my goal. It's part of what got me making seeds. Uh, I did not breed the golden goat. I should be, I want to be very clear about that. People give me credit for it. I did not breed golden goat. It was given to me by Pineapple Express, my buddy. Uh, it was bred by a guy named Mr. Dank in Topeka, Kansas. He named it golden goat because when you take your soda bottles to the recycling center, the recycling center was named golden goat. When you take all your soda bottles there, all the sweet, sticky soda bottles smell like uh, that hot, sticky, sweet smell in the middle of summer. And the Golden Goat's got that sweet smell. So we called it Golden Goat. Wow. Yeah. I, I, I can see it now that I hear it. I yep. can see it. Sweet soda flavor as I drink a sweet soda. Well, and that kind of actually, geez, you know, leads me to the next question is because, you know, I know that you have feminized and I know that you have regular seeds. And actually, if you were doing this with the golden goat, this is probably something that you came across early with the feminization process. And yes. boy, have we come a long way. I mean, now you can order, you know, pre-made spray and that's no problem with that. But how did you, how did you trial or, you know, uh, trial and error the uh, yeah. process of making seeds? Oh. I had to, I had to do what everybody does now. Oh, excuse me. I'm going to clear my throat real hard. <clears> throat> okay. That's the last one. Um, I had to do what everybody else does. I went to the internet and read what the guys before me did. Um, I talked to Subcool and um, I talked to a guy named Swerve. Swerve doesn't have the best reputation. Uh, a lot of people are not, <clears throat> excuse me. A lot of people are not fans of Swerve, <clears throat> but I must say that if Swerve didn't give me some advice on making STS, I probably wouldn't know exactly how to do it. Uh, I adjusted his recipe and his idea quite a bit to master my own recipe, but <clears throat> he gave me the head start. He kind of said, buy these two things and mix them together. And that's all he told me, buy this powder and this powder and mix them. And th there were no ratios or amounts of water involved. I had to find all that out on my own. But through uh, rollitup.org and uh, what's the old one, um, overgrow.com and a couple other websites, I was able to piece it all together and just build the recipe. And I had to go spray probably sprayed five plants the first time and then just watched what they did. The one I sprayed the first one didn't do anything. The second one did a little, the one in the middle was just right. And then the other two, I roasted them. They didn't even make any pollen. So you can't overspray. Yep. Have you found, you know, after you have kind of, you know, perfected the craft and, and doing this multiple times, have you found some strains that just don't want to reverse? Because that's also something that we hear. And if you're new to it, and you just have one of those strains, you may get discouraged from ever trying it again. Right. Yes. Um, so I took, I made a strain called, I call it Grateful Dog. Full disclosure, Grateful Dog is a Deadhead OG reversal project. I took uh, Deadhead OG number nine, got labeled Grateful Dog. I made Fems of that. Those seeds got labeled Grateful Dog. Then I grew, uh, the one that came out of that is My Keeper Grateful Dog. That S1 is Grateful Dog. I took the original pollen from the Deadhead OG and put it on the Grateful Dog. And the seed that came out of that, my favorite keeper, is number 77. 
because my favorite year of the Grateful Dead is 1977. Uh, it will not reverse. I can't reverse that one. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Um, Matt Riot sold me a spray called Elite X, and he swears it will reverse it. I haven't tried it yet, but Matt Riot says that this other product called Elite X Reversal Spray will reverse it. But silver thiosulfate, colloidal silver, has not done anything to it. It doesn't even budge. Wow. And that's, yeah. it's great that you do have that stubborn plant because, you, you know, proof is in the pudding with everything on this plant. You're like, you guarantee oh, yeah. results? Yeah. Let's it try. Won't, it won't harm. It won't reverse. It's, it's a killer plant. Number 77. Yeah. I've never given out a clone of 77. She stays really close to me. I was going to say, that sounds like a wonderful plant to work with. Again, those, those traits are very solid. How does that maybe work through your testing process, whether it's sending you know, beans out to testers to get more looks at it or in your own uh, grow. What, what, do you, what happens when you start to see yeah. something with hermaph hermaphroditic tendencies? Uh, what goes is away. the approach? If it's an intersex, it goes away. I'll send an email to everybody that I know that purchased it and say, throw this away. Don't waste time with it. It is trash. I don't, um, I don't support intersex plants in any way. Maybe it sounds crazy, but as a person that sells seeds, you guys are relying on me to not get intersex plants. You trust that you're going to get quality plants. And I feel, I'd feel terrible if I harmed out your garden and ruined your shit. So uh, if it's intersex at all, I throw it away. I don't mess with it. There are so many plants out there. Why are you going to mess with intersex? It's like, that's just a big red flag. It's the biggest red flag. Yeah. Yeah. No. And then that's really good to hear as well. Again, we talked about, or at least for me, the importance of medicinal growers, especially if you're a small medicinal grower and you may have four plants and that's your medicine for the next six months. One yeah. of them herms throws the seeds. I would feel freaking horrible. So yeah. yeah, we do. Everybody does their best. So, okay. That's good. And no, no tolerance policy. Uh, yeah. yeah. That's, yeah. that's how I, I like to get it. I can replace your seeds if you have a problem, but I cannot replace your electricity, your soil, your time, your energy. So I, I will replace the seeds, but I can't do, I can't replace all the other effort you put into it. So I'm aware of it and I don't, I don't want to be that guy. There are plenty of breeders out there. We know them. They were cruising. They were living life. And then they sold a bunch of herms and I haven't heard from them. So yeah. I don't want to be that guy. Yeah, definitely. And you've been around for a very long time and, you know, I hope to be around just as long and that's, you know, the long-term vision is what gets you there. Yes. So don't, yeah. don't be short-sighted. We're not going anywhere, bro. We're, we're, we're in. <laughs> nice. Very stoked. Very stoked. You know, another thing that you're doing as far as like taking caution and taking care, I did see uh, on the website that you mentioned that the seeds that you're offering are HLVD certified, clean and free. Can you maybe tell people why that matters and what that, what that is about? Because I don't think a lot of people understand that just from a seed. That's a great opportunity. Um, let's start by saying what HLVD is. HLVD is hop latent viroid. It's a uh, virus in your plants that it's latent. So you don't see it until it's too late, basically about week six, seven, maybe week eight in flower. You notice these plants that used to give me three pounds of light. I'm going to get one and a half pounds this time. And it all looks sad. Uh, that is hop latent viroid. It just makes the plants turn into duds is what we call them. They just kind of dud out and don't perform like they should. Um, we have found, I can't say we scientists, more qualified folks than myself that I trust and rely on and pay money to have told me that that is possible to be bred into a seed and sent onto a garden via seed. It, uh, what they have discovered is, uh, and I can't confirm this, what I understand is it is not in the seed itself. It's not in the zygote. It's on the coating of the seed. So if we were to wash the seeds, we can remove that. But I'm doing a step ahead of that. Um, I'm taking all of my breeding plants, my males and females, and I'm sending them into labs for actual HLB testing. Uh, we cut off three leaves from every plant, one up top, one in the middle, and one low, and then also take a two to three inch root section and mail in the leaves and the root section with the sample number. And I don't breed with anything until I get it an HLV test. Anything that comes in goes into quarantine. It actually just sits right here in the studio before it goes into my grow space. And I send that HLV test in. Um, I've pre-ordered them, so I've got them on hand now. And once you pre-order them, you've paid for them. So then you can just send them in whenever you want. So anytime something comes in, I just throw in the envelope and send it right off and takes about three days to get there and then two days for the test. So within a week, I know if that plant is safe or not. Um, nothing has come in lately with HLVD on it. We did get one thing that one leaf was questionable, but the root didn't show it and the other two leaves did not. So that plant got the chop anyway and it just went bye bye, never made it to the room. So yeah, I'm testing everything now. Uh, we do it every six to eight weeks. Honestly, I'm not going to test the entire rooms 
every six to eight weeks. We're gonna just it's gonna be like a drug test. We're gonna see who gets a random in the room because if I feel like if one plant has it, they're all going to because of the way I cut clones. Unfortunately, this virus is heavily spread through water, and I use an aero cloner. So if one clone goes in that aero cloner with HLVD and that water splashes up, it picks up the HLVD and it spreads it to every cut in my cloner if it exists. So I'm being very aware. Like I said, I don't want to be that guy. I've got a, I'm, I've got a reputation of following. Uh, people know who I am. They know how to find me. I can't screw up your garden. I would, I'd, they'd burn me at the stake, dude. <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's a, you know it's good that you put that sort of pressure on yourself because i think that is important and more people should apply that to themselves I appreciate that. Yeah. yeah um a lady named miss dodson i wish i knew her first name i was in seventh grade and this lady named miss dodson said set yourself up for success and i'll never forget that phrase just set myself up i could screw this off and have a shitty tomorrow or i could prepare tonight and tomorrow is going to be successful and I just use that mindset in my business and my grow uh, and almost everything I do set myself up for success. It's your choice. You know what I mean? Everything you do, you can choose to go watch TV and eat some Doritos, or you can go sweep that shit up in your grow room. It's up to you. So if you want to win, win or go eat Doritos. Yeah. And a lot of people think, oh, they just got lucky. They had a lucky break. It's like maybe, but they set themselves up to be there. So yeah. right time, yeah. right place. I'm going to touch on that. This didn't just happen. A lot of people think that one day I was a, su a successful seed breeder. Keep in mind, we started by talking about my dispensary in 2008. So this did not just come out of anywhere. You've got to put in the time, the energy, and the work. So if you feel like I just came out of nowhere and you're like, I want to get there, I've been working at this for, I can't do math that quickly, but 2008 was not yesterday. So keep going, guys. Don't get discouraged. Don't think this just happens overnight. You got to build this. Yep. And I always told my wife too, with she's building her, you know, yoga business is it's the solid foundation. That's what matters the most. If you have the solid foundation and the right tools, when the, you know, the task comes up, you'll be well prepared for it and you'll shine. So yep. build relationships, let your yep. clients trust you. Yeah. Yep. So many breeders won't even put their faces out there. Like there are probably a hundred breeders on every website and five of us will come do interviews, you know, and it's always the same five guys. It's me and Jinx and, um, I can't think of the other guys right now, but it's all like, and Tyler from family tree, it's all the yep. five of us on shows all the same time, you know, all, all good guys, all people I've spoken with. And, and I'm actually glad to actually be able to talk with you now because I've listened to you, watched you, known you, have grown your genetics, but we've never actually directly talked. I know we've been on a few panels together, but never one-on-one. -on -one. Right. Yeah. We, we don't get freedom on panels. We're always just being directed. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Just hang out, but it really is good to connect with you. Yeah, I appreciate it. And and you know what? I will tell you one way where you are kind of that guy. You are kind of that guy when it comes to keeping prices affordable, which I think is pretty awesome. Yeah. Has that been a conscious effort for you as well? Because again, you've got the track record. The genetics are good. You could be charging, you know, multiple hundreds of dollars per pack like we see some other people, but you don't. I appreciate that. It's on purpose. Um I, I like money, but I don't need all of it. It'd be cool, you know, but I don't want, right. I want to be able to look you in the face when I tell you how much shit costs. If I said right. it's 120 a pack, I'd have to look over there as I said it. I couldn't, I'd feel bad and then shake your hand and then smoke a dab with you after. I'd feel like I just ripped you off. Um, other breeders don't like it when I talk about this. I can make so many seeds in such little space and such little time that I don't see the purpose to sell them for exorbitant amounts of money. Um, I've got them, they're in a baggie, they're ready to go. Why do I want them to sit here on a shelf and get a hundred when I can put them in your garden for 40? It just, that's the purpose is to grow them. And yes. my theory also is, like I just said, I could sell them. I don't, they're gonna sit there if I charge you a hundred, it's gonna take me a year or I can put them out for 40 and sell it in two months. And that, that's a smarter business move and it's better for the seeds, they're getting out there and growing. And I try to remember the roots. I get lost occasionally. I forget. I want to buy more hoodies and more sneakers and I want to live lavishly. But I try to remember that medical marijuana is where I started. That's what started this. And sick people don't have a lot of extra money. People with cancer and medical bills, they can't spend 120 bucks on a pack of seeds plus a grow tent, a grow light, the electricity, the dirt. That's 2000 bucks to get set up plus a pack of seeds. Like, I don't, I don't need to do that to people. I'm comfortable. Yeah, look, I'm wearing a nice hoodie. I got a cool necklace. What else do I need? You know, like, yeah, yeah. More, better product at a lower price. Yeah. 
Yep. And to get it out there, you know, overgrow, you were a part of overgrow, get more plants out in the world. And by golly, I'll tell you, when you see somebody else growing your plant, enjoying the plant, it's, there's not really many words for it other than awesome. (laughs) Yes. I I get messages from people that tell me like I had a medical condition and I was dying. They're still, we're all going to die, but they, they saw it coming and they discovered a plant that I bred and they've been smoking that and somehow extended their life. Or maybe we're just extra comfortable for the last year, you know, and that stuff will touch you when someone's like, I was, you know, I'm at the end of my life and your medicine is making it more enjoyable. I'm not as depressed. I'm not as sad. I'm not in as much pain. I just need, it makes me shine as well. Like I feel like I let out pain and depression when they tell me that. Heck yeah, man. Gosh, all the, all the right freaking reasons. Right. Yeah. <laughs> That's all I got to say. I, I got to be a hundred percent. I forget sometimes I forget, you know what I mean? I get lost. I want to buy more sneakers and a faster car and a bigger house. And then I go, or I'll stay in this house and keep the car I've got and enjoy the life. I can be happy with who I am. But sometimes, you know, it gets ahead of me, but I'm trying my best to stay, stay focused now. Well, you know what? We're all human. And at the same time, you deserve a good life as well for the quality of life you give to others. So it's, it's a give and a take. There is no wrong or right. Just don't become a mega church pastor and we'll probably be fine. So (laughs) if I had a mega church, would you come? That's what I want to know. Yeah, actually, I'm sure a lot of us would. (laughs) (laughs) Can you imagine the smell of that collection plate? Yeah. Yeah. There you go. It's gonna be good. You have to take a dab to get in. If you don't dab, you're not invited, dude. The dab's at the door. <laughs> the wafers are in. Okay, no, I'll stop. I'll stop. Oh man. So, what 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 do you have coming up for people as far as let's say new genetics coming out? What what are you yeah. excited about? What what is the latest thing that dropped they can get today? And what's maybe something they may be looking for in the first part of next year? Cool. Um, today, I would recommend. Um, Probably uh, frequency shift or chemical cocktail. Those are two of my newest. Frequency shift is Soma's New York City Diesel to the Golden Goat. Um, it'll change your mind. That's why I call it frequency shift. <laughs> that name was inspired by my friend Natalie Rise, a reggae artist. Uh, she likes to give like a motivational, energetic speech between songs, and uh, one of her things is a frequency shift to change the frequency. So I named it after her. Uh, the other one was chemical cocktail. That's a lemon diesel to afterglow. Um, it's like you took a kiwi strawberry snapple, the kiwi strawberry snapple, and put diesel, just a hint of diesel feel in it, just and then shook it up and took a drink. That's kind of what it's like. And those are available now on I Redirect. Uh, the fun part coming up, I've been teasing this kind of randomly and not talking a lot about it, but kind of dropping hints. Um, I acquired a skunk one cut, a 1998 or a 1986 96 skunk number one that has been reversed and put on a lot of great cuts. There may be, um, say, Cherry Paloma to Skunk Number One coming up. There may be some Chem Dog to Skunk Number One. Uh, There may be some straight Skunk Number One coming up. There's a Purple Skunk coming. So yes, uh, you that's the that's the most info I've given on a podcast is the, the those details right there. So Skunk is coming. I've been promising the Skunk is not gone. It is coming. That is exciting you got me over here like mr burns yes Yes. they will have to get thoroughly tested um i will grow a bunch of them myself i'll do a germination test is the most important uh then i'll grow them and i'll see that they're great i'm already sure they're going to be amazing once i'm happy that i know they're not intersex and they're not a shitty germination rate then i'll send them out to testers and then that's when the fun begins we'll see what they do uh, over in Hawaii. We'll see what they do in Maine. We'll see what they do in a grow in Compton. We'll see what they do in Denver. We'll see what they do in hydro, soil, LEDs, HPS. And then we start getting all these pictures and grow reports. And that's when it gets fun. And then I can announce the official release once we get them kind of, once we know it's legit, then we can announce it and release it for sure. Skunk, skunk is coming. And I'm very confident and excited. And, and, and I know, too, you know, when we order directly from the website, there's, you know, occasionally some freebies tossed in there, too. With some of these testers, do they do they go out without a name? And then people just how, how do you feel about that with like some of the freebies or the testers? Do you put names on them and like maybe people might be biased just by a name or do you get a full report? I used to not tell people what the testers were. I wouldn't even tell you what they were because that will bias you. But now. Um, it was hard to get people to reply with test reports. So now to be honest, I charge for tester seeds. 
Uh, most seeds are 40 to 60 a pack on the website. The testers are 30 bucks. Um, you can you have an opportunity. You may have the brand new stuff before anybody else if you buy it as a tester, but they don't have names. So they just go out as whatever, like uh, the current one is uh, P91 to Jack the Ripper or LA Kush to Jack the Ripper might be another one that's coming out. So it's just labeled as that. And then it comes with the card that says, hey, you've been chosen as a tester or thank you for testing. And then it gives you a link to my website where you can fill out a questionnaire and tell me what you thought of the seeds. So that's where I send the testers. Um, the freebies are testing. The freebies are never testers because um, I want to get you stuff that you can grow. I don't want to give you experiments as your free ship. That feels a little bit rude. Sometimes they don't have names and I just put them out as the cross. And then I watch what you guys do with them or kind of just get ideas from you guys. And then I'll get a name from it eventually. But a lot of times the testers are things I only have 500 of. And it wouldn't be a point to pack up that many packages. So I just put them in three packs and put them on the website as freebies. I, I might've said testers just a minute ago, but I meant freebies. Yeah. Yeah, the freebies are stuff I'm kind of low stock on or something where it's brand new and I don't know what it's going to like do in a lot of gardens. It's been tested, but not widely. So then I get the ideas from you guys for names. When it comes to testers, what sort of information are you looking for from people or people that want to, you know, say they pick up, you know, the, the discounted priced pack, what sort of feedback do you want? What are you looking Ooh. for? Um, Germination rate. How many seeds did you attempt to germinate? How many sprouted? How many made it to the flower room and how many made it to harvest is a huge question. Um, what kind of phenotypes did you see? What was your internodal uh, spacing? Was it real far? Was it real tight? Uh, what kind of branching did you get? Some plants uh, grow straight out, some grow straight up, some grow sideways and around. What did you get? Uh, what was your flavors and aromas? Uh, were there any anomalies? Like what, what stood out? What, was there anything that made you want to message me right away and say, hey, this plant's doing this? And the number one question that I asked that I think is probably the most important is, would you grow this again? Like, are you happy with your purchase? Would you do this again? Because if people say no, then that probably won't get released. But if most of the people say yes, then that's a very good high potential for letting that out. So just like dating, you know, is she crazy? Does, does she smell bad? Like, just looking for all the details. <laughs> hey, when it comes to cannabis, sometimes we do like those crazy smell bad ones. <laughs> right, yeah. I, I always make a joke. I'm like, it smells like a burnt hair and a ball sack and a dirty foot dumped into a can of paint and then set on fire. I'll take an ounce. <laughs> so true. <laughs> so true. We are, we are an odd lot sometimes. And that's, uh, you know, I, I always kind of like joke that I'm either ahead of the times or behind the times. And I do remember that, you know, era where it was just all Kush. It was all OG. Yeah. And that was when I kind of discovered Subcool and discovered some more of the, the like the fruitier flavors, the more palate uh, pleasing taste. And I was really all about that. And then, you know, it, it came it more accepted and, I was like, man, this Kush stuff isn't that bad anymore. So then I went to that. So then I was behind the time. So either ahead or behind the time. Yeah. And uh, it's going to be, you're going to see like skunk come back and then diesel will come back and then the Kush will come back. And then all of a sudden it'll be fruity again. It'll be some sort of desserty fruit chirps all over again. It just goes in cycles. It's about every six months, something new comes out. And remember when Girl Scout cookies was the most popular strain and now you don't even hear that anymore. Now Girl Scout cookies disappeared and then Mac showed up and then Mac was popular and then Mac disappeared and now lemon cherry gelato. And then there's that one in California that they're selling for $7,000 an ounce or whatever that is. There's, yeah. So it's, it's always something new coming. Yeah. yeah. Uh, you mentioned Subcool, man. Without Subcool, I don't know that I would have uh, been able to do what I did. Subcool, uh, he didn't directly tell me that he was passing me a torch, but some of the conversations and talks we had, that dude handed me the torch. I didn't realize it at the time until a couple years after Subcool passed. Rest in peace, brother. I love you. Yeah. But uh, once Subcool was gone, it started dawning on me what he, he knew. He was he was passing that torch to me, bro. He, he oh man, he's responsible. And I'm pulling out right now just because I have this here. But it's my my TGA Subcool seeds. This was one of the yeah. first pro packs that I bought. It was it was the Jax Cleaner Two. Excellent. Let's see if they get it to focus. But yeah, this had. You know, the Agent Orange, the Chernobyl, Dairy Queen, Grape Lime, Ricky, that's one I don't see anymore. Um, but yeah, he he was a person who put out a lot of education as well. Um, 
gosh, I, I, you know, I wish I had the chance to, to really have good conversations with the guy, but you know, yeah. I missed it, but his genetics live on and it yeah, was through yeah. him and team green Avengers. I learned really about breeding for medicinal qualities. Yes. So important. Yes. Uh, some cool taught me a lot of what to do. And I'm also going to say a lot of what not to do in this industry. He was, he was an amazing dude. He was hard to connect with. If you were friends with him, you were friends forever. And if not, right. oh well, like he, he, might, he might talk to you, but there was just something, if you got in that door, then you were his buddy forever. It was really cool. You taught me a lot of stuff. Um, <clears throat> without that weed nerd show, I don't know that I would exist. I'm, I'm doing the weed nerd. You know what I mean? If you watch me, I'm, I'm, I'm the weed nerd. And I didn't realize it. I'm doing a weed nerd show without Subby. So he lives on forever through us. And I hope, I'm, I hope I can, I hope I'm passing that torch. I hope there's generations behind me that are grabbing all those, the, the flames I've lit. And I hope they're running with that torch too, to keep me and Subcool going when we're gone. Yep. I, you know, I definitely think there will. You're, you're a well-respected and well-loved person in the community. And that just kind of comes again from, from long-term actions. So hats off to you again there. Appreciate that. Yeah, I like that. Thank you. You know, one, one more uh, question I do have is, you know, a lot of people, again, they're, they're starting to want to make seeds or kind of trying to work on their own stuff. When it comes to feeding, is, is there anything different that you're doing once a plant has been pollinated or is it just pretend like it was flowering? Do you let it go longer? Different light schedules? Anything? In the well, when I talk about that different light schedule, people are going to go crazy. We'll touch on that at the end. Um, mostly the same feeding. I do, um, I don't do the main bloom boosters. If you're adding like bat guano for a booster or shine, I don't do shine or uh, the bud swell because I'm not growing for buds. I'm growing for seeds. I'll replace that with a little more nitrogen, a little more cow mag. And then, uh, I've been dropping this bomb. I've been doing this for years and I haven't shared it a lot until recently, but liquid aminos, that liquid amino acid product from microbe life hydroponics, Aminos are the building blocks of life. Why not feed your seedlings amino acids and give them that head start? So the amino acid is something I've added that really makes happy seeds. And the part that's going to make everyone go crazy, um, I change my light cycle. Once my plants are pollinated, I do two rounds of pollination. I'll hit them once and then I'll let the plant build a, another pollen and then I'll dump them again. And then I cut down the boy. Uh, then a couple days after that, once I'm sure pollination is successful, I change my lights from 12-12 to 18 hours on and six hours off. My theory, I'm not growing for buds because this will make your buds look crazy and they'll re and they'll look like trash, but I'm growing for seeds. When I do this, it speeds up my seed harvest by about a week. I can cut down a week earlier than I used to and my seeds are bigger, they're fatter, they're healthier and I have a better germination rate and less of those little white shitty seeds at the end just by going to 18.6. My theory is that light is the number one source of fuel and energy for that plant. So just crank it into the light. I'm not growing for flower. The flowers look like trash, to be honest with you, when I do that. They look terrible. They re -veg in the end and they have shoots coming out of them, but I'm not, I don't care. It's right. all about seed production and the seeds are amazing. The seeds are high quality. So yeah, 18.6 all through the end of flower for a seeded crop. Now here's where people are going to say I'm extremely crazy. We're going to get called names. Um, I also do that on unseeded crops on sensi crops for the last 10 days the last the final 10 days of flower if you flush that's a whole nother we can do a four-hour podcast on that one one night if you do flush during the flush phase turn your lights back on to 18.6 you're not going to be on 18.6 long enough to re-veg but it'll be enough photons and enough photon energy enough par to expand your buds they'll get beefier and more dense uh, maybe a little bit more harvest weight and you could possibly speed them up by a day or two if you just do the math and think about how many hours of light you're getting, you can basically cut that off at the end. That would be that would be worth trying. I would be interested in that because, again, you are trying to build biomass. And that's one thing I don't think people understand when they're running their lights at 100 percent on an 18.6 for a veg cycle. And then they switch to 12.12 and they're still giving it that same 100 percent. It's like you were actually given more light and veg yes. than your flowering plants. Yep, absolutely. <laughs> So at the end, I'm cranking them up with that little bit more light and giving them all that photon energy, I'm just letting them just swell up at the end. I and mean, nothing's going to go wrong. You're going to cut them down before reveg starts. And if you do want to reveg, then you're way ahead of the game. You've got a huge head start. And you can also move your veg crop into that room and have more veg space. You just bought a bedroom. 
I, I, yeah, I was going to say, because that is, you know, that's what I keep my bench cycle on. And I, I do remember hearing that with the seeded plants. I, I was going to try it once, but then I like chickened out at the edge. I got to the edge of the bridge jump and I'm like, I'm just going to go with what I know. <laughs> that's okay. It's okay that you said, I'm going to go with what I know. What happens a lot though, is people message me and call me the R word and say I'm crazy for just yeah. telling people to run this. But the people that have done it, they message me and they say, bro, I got 25% more finished product or bro, my seeds look way better. The people that don't do it message me and tell me I'm crazy. So it's always one of the two camps. It's never someone that has done it telling me I'm crazy. That's that's the thing. That, and that's a good rule to live by. It's like you can't talk smack unless you've actually tried it. If you've tried it and you still want to talk smack, then okay. You could still be completely wrong, but at least you made the first step. Uh, don't knock it till you try it. Um, you know, this summer, um, you know, there's there's a lot of festivals that are going to be going on. Are you going to be out and about traveling at any of these, or can people uh, try to find you at some shows? Oh, I'll be at the Dude Gross Cup. I will absolutely be at the Dude Gross Cup, June first in Laporte, Colorado. Um, yeah, uh, I may have some tricks up my sleeve. I may be entering. I'm not sure if I want to tell you what I'm entering with yet, but it's growing now, and I do plan to enter. Last year, um, the first place winner was Irie Army, and the second place winner was Irie Army. Tenth place was Irie Army. Number 12 was Irie Army. Yeah, a bunch of the Irie Army crew was there. We come out strong. So, yeah, come hang out. Come hang out. It's a good You show up this year. I'm hoping to. That is the plan. This will be my first year, and uh, it'll be nice to see so many of the familiar faces and names from online in person. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, I've met so many. Uh, Blue Kiss called us internet imaginaries. And then we all met and now we're actually real friends. We're not imaginary anymore. So there's something I do notice in the Discord server where I hang out. The people that I've met, like uh, my buddy Billy flies from Hawaii and hangs out with me kind of frequently. When we hang out in the Discord, there's a, a much deeper bond. We're, we're much closer friends just from him flying to hang out a couple of times. So yeah, that, it builds cool bonds when you go to those events. Then you're not just uh, that guy on the internet. We can actually walk up and say hi and actually connect with you and it's cool. It, takes you off that uh that platform and you're just one of us now which we enjoy sit down and relax and just enjoy the moment and the atmosphere yeah. because it's you know it's everybody that makes it happen we're yeah. we're lucky to be a part of it yes come smoke dabs and share a joint with everybody it's a good time there's good food lots of cool people there lots of good vendors breeders and lots of good smoke at the dgc cup you'll get to sample like 40 or 50 samples of weed if you go bro wow That'll yeah. be uh, exhausting, but I'm up for the challenge. Yes. So, you know, we I talk about uh, seed collecting a lot, too, because I'm into collecting. I'm into growing. I'm into popping them, too, just as important. But, you know, what, what are a few things that you maybe have hidden in your uh, to get to pile or some things that you'd like to pop next from um, somebody that's, else? That's oh, from somebody else. That's a really good question from somebody else. Um, and I've got so many great things. I'm looking at a box of seeds I just got from a friend recently that I'm not sure if they want me to talk about who they are. Um, I've got a friend in New York. Okay, so um, I don't know how to say this exactly, but I've made friends with a, one of Mel Frank's protégés and they have been sending me seeds. And those are the most exciting things. All that old Mel Frank stuff. Uh, Mel Frank has given me blessings. He said, these seeds are yours to play with, grow, breed, sell trade do what you will and mel frank is one of my inspirations he's one of the best cannabis authors and growers and educators ever and so i've got seeds from him that are definitely exciting yeah the mel frank stuff has my attention so that makes me wonder you know as far as looking for new genetics to add into what you're working with do you tend to are well at least currently because i'm sure it varies but are you looking in the past? Are you looking towards some of the current or some things you may be hot and hitting? Cause you know, Mel Frank, his collection is not new and it's got right. a lot of unworked things that we would love to see incorporated. Um, I do, I, I try to avoid the hype. If it's a uh, super hyped up strain, I don't fall for the hype. I'm not a, a trendy kind of guy. So I try to find it's visually appealing plants is plants that I like to smoke is mainly the criteria. I don't care if it's older or newer or right in the middle. If it's good smoke and gets me super high and grows well, that's what I need. But uh, all the new stuff is all the same to me. It's all uh, Skittles or a cake. So you got to get some of that old school stuff to freshen up that new stuff. 
And all the new stuff came from that old stuff. So you can unlock really cool things by putting them together. And like you said earlier, I don't know if I'm ahead of the trends or behind the trends or right in the middle, <laughs> but I feel like I'm, I've got a good lane. Can, can, you, can you tell us any of the strain names or is that too top secret at this point? Or maybe um, one or two that you're uh, no, most excited on. He doesn't even name stuff like that. He just does like Mel Frank's Durban Poison to 1986 Skunk Number no. One crossed to Afghani. Like he doesn't yeah. give him any names or anything. So uh, that Skunk Number no. One to Durban Poison is probably on the top of my list of excitement. And then he does a lot of Afghani and Nepalese stuff that is really exciting. The Afghani stuff is right on my alley. It's got that cushy, old school, earthy flavor. Once it gets that perfume thing, I'm not into it, but that old school earthy sandalwood stuff, I really love. Okay. Yeah. Kind of the exotic. So typical of a lot of Afghanicas. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Like I said, he doesn't even name them. So I'm just like, it's the Afi Congolese Mexican from 1982. Like that's just all he calls it. And he knows when you start referring to him is that he knows exactly which plants they are. His strain catalog in his mind is much wider and sharper than mine. He remembers details of his grows in the 70s, which is wild. Wow. Yeah, yeah. Do you, do you think we'll see him kind of reemerge? He, he's been one of the people that have just kind of, at least to me, seemingly stayed quiet as far as putting yeah. himself out there. I think Which he might, the door is wide open if he wanted to, you know? I think he doesn't want the spotlight. I think he's, he's an older gentleman at this point. He's not a spring chicken, mm -hmm. and I think he's done with that. He's not into the social media and all that stuff. So I think he's letting myself and one of my partners kind of do all that for him. He's not into, he doesn't want to get involved. That's cool. And that's absolutely fine. And, you know, you've got to respect that about people, especially people who have, we know of them because of things they were trying to hide. So right. I, I, I get it. Old, old habits die hard. And, you know, as we get up in age to uh, social media is not for everybody. I'll say that much. Right. Yeah. He allegedly grew a lot of cannabis. So he's, he's probably going to just retire and stay quiet now. Yeah. It, you know, that's cool. I'm glad that people are able to work with that because, again, he's able to see that stuff kind of get carried on and live vicariously through others, yes. which, again, you know, that's a, a fun thing about having people grow out your genetics and you're putting them in the right hands. So do you have are you able to get uh, like specific directions of, OK, look for this one or look for that leaner or are things being pretty like stable as far as genetic expression? Uh, no, he's got a variety. You can see, um, I haven't caught on exactly because I haven't grown enough of them, but you can see the entire world of cannabis and the seed that he's given us. Like, yeah, wow. there's, yeah, the entire, because he's done like Thai to Afghani and Afghani to Nepalese and Congolese to Laotian. And so he's got the entire world of cannabis. If, if we could sit down, for, it would take us five hours, six hours to just sit down and talk about each one and where it came from. Uh, we, we can figure all that out, but it's just a strain by strain basis right now. It's like a, Hey, what do you recommend? And, and he, he's got more details than me about these plants in his head. It's like, he impresses me with the knowledge. <laughs> you, you mentioned the, the greenhouse earlier. Um, have you, have you grown other like greenhouse genetics or European genetics? Yeah. I tend to say. Um, I've grown a lot of the Euro stuff. I used to order from uh, attitude seed bank back in the day. And those Euro genetics are why I started breeding. I was highly unsatisfied with the stuff I was buying from Europe. It just didn't, politely, the Dutch folk have bred cannabis into a pussy ass plant. They want all their plants <laughs> to be either weak and flimsy. They'll make good bud, but they're flimsy. They're not mold resistant. They're not pest resistant. Yeah. Uh, they're just growing in those little tiny sterile rooms in Amsterdam and they made a bunch of weak ass plants. Uh, so I kept buying stuff and was not happy with it at all. The greenhouse, I've grown their White Widow, the Super Lemon Haze, uh, the Lemon Skunk, the Church. I've grown a bunch of stuff from greenhouse. It was easy to get back in the day, so I had access to a lot of his seeds. I've got I've got my first greenhouse stuff going right now, uh, just a greenhouse cheese. Oh, cool. I was, I was looking for skunks for a while and tried a few things, and I didn't find what would satisfy my palate. So I'm like, you know what? I'm just going to go with cheese. Cheese is another one. So I kind of collected a bunch of the – like European seed bank cheeses, because if it were cool. somewhere, it, the, the crazy part is realistically, I know the person to call the person to get an original cut, but I don't want that. Honestly, I want to so find too easy, right? it is, it would be too easy. It takes the fun out of like the hunt and, and yeah. searching for it. But I also want to find something that's maybe a little bit 
different but same note, you know, and everybody has a different idea of, you know, cheese, but what it is to me, you know? I say it's like going to an Italian restaurant. We know that you and I want Italian food, but I'm a vegetarian. I don't know your dietary preference. When we walk into the Italian restaurant, they're going to give us a menu and it's going to be all Italian food, but one might be, I might get the white sauce, you might get the red sauce, and we're both going to love it. And it's still Italian food. You got to find that phenotype it clicks for you. Yeah, I, I agree with that. Dude, you said something neat. I don't know if you even know what you said. Do you realize that cheese is skunk number one? Yeah, Exodus okay. cut, Exodus yeah, cut. So it's just a phenotype. Same, just cheese is a phenotype of the skunk. The and and you you said the eighties earlier too, and that it makes me because there's the Sam Watson. It's like pre and post Sam Watson. It's like Neville skunk or Sam Watson skunk man yeah. skunk. Right. And Sam tended to be sweeter, whereas like Neville's or the older stuff was the more skunky, the more yeah. like acrid one that people are looking for and that, that they want. Yeah. But, and then do you know about Pie's skunk also? There's a guy named Pie that had skunk as well. No, I don't. That's a whole, that's a whole other avenue of the skunk. Yeah, he, did a, he was working a different realm with it. Yeah. Was he American-based or UK-based uh, or...? Pie was American. Pie was an American guy. Yeah. Okay. He was American okay. working with the skunk. Yeah. It was great that you brought up Skunk Man Sam. That was pretty neat. That was cool. Yeah. I didn't know that people still knew about Skunk Man Sam. Oh, gosh. Yeah. So, well, like you said, we're probably about the same age. So, yeah. Yeah. I, I do like the Lord because that's, you know, that's the foundation, at least in my mind. It's like 70s and 80s. You had like the what we call now are the land races, you know, Colombians, the ties, the stuff that Mel Frank has, you know, the, that type of stuff. And that basically built the next building blocks, which were skunk number one, Afghan number one, Hayes, those types of things. OG and then Kush. those, yeah, and those led right into the OG, Kush, Camdog, Diesel, yeah. and then now yeah. that, you know, led. But that's the natural progression I see in my head. And with like the Amsterdam genetics you mentioned, when, when I think of like the, the Netherlands or like European genetics, they're all very, you know, stable or, or gosh not stable homozygous for to use a fancy term there they're all very homozygous but they lack the expressions that we have in america but we everything is heterozygous here nothing is the same you plant 10 seeds you get like eight expressions whereas there you plant 10 seeds you get 10 you know one maybe two expressions but it's all eh. yeah yep. so, yeah no, i totally agree with that completely you said something a minute ago that i'd never put together you did this leapfrog motion with strains. Uh, we started with those old school things and then we made the next generation. Then we took one of those old school strains and put it to the new shit to make the next stuff. It looks like that's what we've done every time because where we left off was Kush. I think the move after that was cookies. And mm -hmm. I don't know, I can't find the truth, but I think that cookies has Durban poison in it is what gives it that minty flavor and that head buzz. So that's the OG Kush and we brought Durban poison back to it. And then we bred all that to cookies and shit. And now we're going back and putting the cookies and the OG. It's like leapfrog. I like that. I never thought of it that way. Well, you know, I mean, just as much as you can trust, you know, like Seed Finders EU or just a lot of the, you know, the speculation, it's that those are the things that go into everything. It's always like, oh, yeah, it's, you know, it's got, you know, it's got the Afghani number one in it. It's, it's yep. you know, it's got to be stable. And then we do that, you know, it's today. It's like, oh, man, it's, it's or, you know, 10 years ago, it's like, oh, it's got cookies. It, it, it's yeah. got cookies in it, which made it an instant freaking hit. So that's why everybody just doubles down on those particular genetics. Yeah, it's fun. To, it's fun to see those trends. I wish I was better at predicting them. Well, you said cycles, though. You know, if, right. if you really get good at something, that's the problem with a lot of the, at least in my opinion, the, the consumer market, it, it changes so fast. If you really are entertaining that crowd, you have to go with the times. You don't really get to be that person. Well, I grow this and it's the best and you're going right. to smoke it. You can't do that's, that anymore. I just got lemon cherry gelato because that's what we want. And I'll go find yes. lemon cherry gelato somewhere. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. But if you stay, you know, you stay good and you stay true to what you're doing, it, it will come back around. And then a lot of these things we've lost or, you know, they're not in the common light anymore. Right. Right. And people are out, someone's out there hoarding your favorite strain. You just don't know where that pork cut is anymore. Yeah. It's probably in the hills of Mendocino. Jerks. <laughs>
right? There are cuts that I wish I could get back that, oh man, I know they're long gone. You don't even want to, like you said, you don't want to reach out to that guy like, hey, I need this cut again. <laughs> yeah, well, if it, if it were mine, then I would definitely do it. But yeah, I, I do like the hunt, man. And that's the fun about popping seeds. That's the fun right. about buying packs and just going through things is even, you know, and we've you've probably done this too. It's like you've popped one and it was, you know, great. It was better than the rest. You still have extra seeds. You didn't take clones of it. You're like, oh, I'll try to get back to it. I've gotten like 98, maybe 99%, but I've never gotten 100% back to where I was. Yeah, I've been preaching take clones of everything. That's really something I've been trying to preach or learn to reveg because that that's always your last option. Um, I just, I've got a bunch of plants that just finally came out of a reveg. They felt like they were stuck in this twisted leaf thing forever. And then one day I walked in and they all went, hey, guess what? Boom, we're back. <laughs> no. I feel I rescued an ice cream cake cut. I, I didn't take a clone of it, and I grew it and realized it was much better than I'd anticipated. So I revenged her and rescued that. Uh, yeah, I've learned now to take cuts of everything because you never know. You never know. Yeah. And I do have 20,000 seeds of some of the crosses I've made, but do I want to run all 20 of them hoping for that one plant again? It might be gone, and that might be it. Have you ever found, you know, in, in those seed hunts, have you ever found something that is just completely left field to everything else that, that caught your interest or yeah. was just like, no, just you're way. dying? Yeah. <laughs> um, I bred this uh, lemon OG and blueberry back in the day. I got this lemon OG from a dispensary. Every time I bought it, it was so good. It sold out all the time. One day they're like, hey, we're selling clones. And I bought the clones and uh, I reversed the lemon OG and put it on blueberry and put it on itself. And we grew out some of the seeds and they looked so gorgeous. Everything was beautiful. Harvested it, dried it, cured it, called all the boys over. We were smoking. We all smoked a bunch of it. And after about 30 minutes in, we're like, I'm not high at all. Everybody, mm -hmm. yeah, no buzz to it at all. No, no connect. Yeah, it was amazing weed. It smelled, it tastes really good. But everybody in the room was like, so does anybody have any weed that'll get us high? Because this weed is terrible. And we grew out a bunch of them and every phenotype was useless to me. Now that I know what I know, maybe it had a very valuable cannabinoid that I wasn't looking for, but it didn't get us stoned like we like I, what weed should do. Like I wonder now if I threw away thousands of really high CBD seeds or something, but at the time it was trash. I was embarrassed. I was like, bro, what did I do? And yeah, so all those seeds are gone. They got thrown in the trash. Oh no. Well, yeah. it, it had the taste, but it makes me wonder though, if it was, you know, a hemp derivative or, you know, do you, are you able to, in Washington, I can't get anything tested. I have a medical license, but I don't have a recreational like I, state market license. I can't have anything tested for CBD, THC, nothing. Are you able to kind of look at that as you go? And do you look for minor cannabinoids? I don't, I don't pay a lot of attention to the lab test for potency and cannabinoids. Um, technically, as a home grower, it's not possible for me to get my stuff lab tested, but I found a trick. There are hemp testing labs that if you send your hemp sample in and say, can you test my hemp? It's and they'll say, this is hemp, sir, it's really hot. You can get away with that two or three times at a testing lab before they catch on to what you're doing. Um, so find a couple and pick the strains you really want to test. But yeah, send in your hemp and find out that your hemp is... 30% THC and does not qualify as hemp and they'll get, let you slide once or twice, maybe three times. Uh, that's, that's, that's hilarious. Kind of yeah. Uh, recently I've been testing for shipping and safety purposes. I've had batches of seeds tested because okay. now when they, when they pull my seeds out of the mail, they say you're sending marijuana. I can say there's no cannabinoids in here. I've got a certificate of authenticity saying my mailed product does not contain cannabinoids. So I've had batches of seeds tested which uh, they don't show any THC, but I had to go through a hemp lab to do those. And I could very easily just send them a weed sample. It wouldn't be a problem. Right. But, yeah, be true. careful if you're sending, if you're, just, if you're just sending a couple of seeds to friends, don't worry. But if you're gonna do a lot of packs, look into the rules because uh, I did get flagged. I, haven't, I wanna talk about it on a private show that I'm gonna do, but I, I can tease it here. I did get flagged and noticed for selling seeds on the internet. Wow. Yikes. Yes. Okay. I, disappeared. I don't well, know if people noticed. I disappeared for three full months. I redirect was down. I could not sell a seed until I jumped through some hurdles. Well, it's again, with the long play in mind, it's good that you took the time to address it the way it needed to be addressed instead of just 
balls to the wall, get it while you can, and then you're done. So. <laughs> That's exactly how I feel. I, and I looked into the rules and the laws and lawyered up, and we found a long-term solution instead of just like keep playing cards. You know, I didn't want to keep playing chess. Uh, I, I just checkmated that shit, and we win. So, yeah, I went the long-term. It was expensive, but we did it. But what would you say to maybe a new grower as just kind of a, a piece of advice or mistake that you made when you were starting that others can yeah. maybe learn from? And then I'll flip it on you, not just as a new grower, as a new mm -hmm. breeder as well. <laughs> as a new grower, the internet is not always right. Don't trust social media. Um, if you post a question on social, there, uh, so there's a couple parts to this, I think. There's no the best. What is the best light, the best nutrient? Uh, we were talking a moment ago. It depends. Um, I don't know if you're growing in soil. I don't know if you're in cocoa. I don't know if you're in hydro. I don't know if you're indoors or outdoors. There's no the best. The best is sunshine and natural dirt, but we can't all do that. So uh, the best is subjective or relative. Uh, it's all about what you're trying to do. Have a goal. Know your goal. Don't try to overdo yourself. And don't let the internet sway your plan and your idea of what your grow should be. We're all going to grow our way. Um, as long as you're happy with the outcome and you're not poisoning or contam contaminating anybody, uh, have fun, grow weed the way you want to grow it. Don't let me or Chad or anybody out there steer you the wrong way or a different way. We'll give you solid advice, but you don't have to do it our way. There's a thousand ways to grow successful cannabis. So don't let the internet screw you up. Don't overdo yourself. And then as a breeder, um, I shouldn't even tell you this, but people think you need to grow these big, lavish, extravagant plants. Bro, grow little tiny plants and pollinate them. You can make... Uh, 30 to 100 seeds in a plant grown in a beer cup. And that's no exaggeration. The first time I make some runs, we were talking about those freebies I give away. Sometimes I'll just put a beer cup with an OG Kush plant and pollinate it with a rise. And I made 100 seeds. I'll take the 50 out I want and give you guys the other 50 as freebies. Uh, you don't need big plants. You can make a lot of seeds in a little tiny bit of space. Uh, don't let it intimidate you. And the pollen part, people are like, but I don't want to pollinate everything. You're only going to pollinate the plants that are in flower. So mm -hmm. flower a small section, like a two by two tent. You can fit plenty of plants in there, pollinate those, cut down the boy, clean up, and then no more pollen to worry about. It's timing. If your plants are in veg or at the end of flower, you don't need to worry about it. There's about a 21 day, 28 day window where you got to stress on pollen. After that, it's not as stressful as it looks. And water deactivates pollen. So just spray everything with water. The pollen is basically dead. So yeah, you don't need as much space, as big of plants as you might anticipate to make a few seeds. You can do it. And I'm not exaggerating. I literally breed in beer cups. There's a picture of the Grateful Dog all over the internet. It's an amazing picture of Grateful Dog. I promise you that was grown in a red solo cup. Dude, the whole plant is this tall. The picture that you see is the entire plant. It looks like a fat nug. It's the entire plant. Full disclosure there. Yeah. yeah. So grow them in beer cups. It's fun. And that's that. Thank you. That's a perfect answer because that is a good way for people to get started on the road. You don't need to make a whole bunch of seeds because you're not really going to run them out. And when you're starting, right. you're going to want to start running things out to relate back to what you said with your Arise Mail to know what things are going to pass on. And then you can go in, you know, I, I should have said making seeds because I kind of, I, I draw the line. There's making seeds. People can make seeds and then there's breeding. Breeding is done with intent. Breeding is done with the kind of the qualifiers that you mentioned earlier. But this this beer cup or small plant method is a great way to start down that road. Because once you start oh, yeah. running out, like the progeny, for me, the, the first time it was most exciting to see the expressions. You're like, oh, this is totally A plant or this is totally B plant. Yeah. Well, that's exciting. Yep. Yeah, you look just like your mom. You look just like dad. Oh, this one's right in the middle. Or why does this one grow like this? Where did this come from? Those are my favorites. But yeah, you know, yeah, little beer cups and veg for make a clone, get it rooted, and then put that bitch in flower and pollinate it. That's all you really need. And then you can even put those beer clones back under 18.6 after they're pollinated and they'll still do the same thing as a big plant would. And do you do you kind of do the same thing when you're pheno hunting, like the first run of the progeny, just like really small to get a, a, a nose for it yeah. versus like grow out the big? Yep. Yeah. There's no need to grow them big. Um, that, that's a waste of time and a lot of waste of space. So I just grow little ones. The first run are little teeny tiny plants. And then I just set them up in a way that the ph photography makes them look gigantic. It's all about perspective at that point. It is. It is. But that gives you a good, a good way to, you know, get the nose and get the taste and the effects. How yes. important is that smoke test for that's, that's the moving most on? 
a lot of people talk about a lab test. How, do, how was the TERP on the lab test? How was the THC on the lab test? I've never had a liquid chromatography machine call me up and buy another bag of weed. So it's all about how it affects people. How do I like it when I smoke it? You know, does, does it, uh, first of all, did it grow well? Because I'm the grower. I got to deal with this plant for 18 something weeks in the grow space. How did it grow? But that smoke report is the most important part. Does it give me the high that I want? Is the high long lasting or does it just come on and fade away? Is it the kind of high? Uh, if it makes me too drowsy or gives me too much brain fog, I might not want it. So yeah, that smoke report is, is I call it the smoke report. That's everything. And, and a lot of times, you know, I'm hearing too, is just, you know, the wash report almost now. That's a question yeah. I guess, like, how does it wash? And I see, you know, you were smoking dabs earlier. So is that something you look at too? Does that, have you ever cut anything, even though you liked it, but it just didn't wash maybe? Um, no, I don't breed specifically for washing, but I do find and identify the washers and put those in the right hands. Uh, I've got some friends, shout out to my buddy Turp, shout out to Hot Rod, uh, big up to Pedro some of the most amazing washers and concentrate makers I know. If I find something that I think washes well, I do my best to get it out to those boys. Uh, they're all expecting something new right now. It's coming guys, I'm just, I'm, 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 I'm picky. But yeah, those, those are the boys I put the washers in the hands of so they can wash it. Uh, Terps just did fist bump for me and it washed super well. He grew it like a champ and he washed it like a master. So yeah, the fist bump from Terps was great. I must, I'd imagine that would be nice when it comes to you instead of having to go through the labor and the work, you're just like, okay, guys, yeah, let me know. I'm not envious of you guys washing and pressing. That is a lot of work. So you've already grown it, and now you're in there in the, that cold room. I hate the cold. So that's the first step that I don't like. And then just being in there Colorado. all Colorado. Yeah, I know. I know. I'm from California, but I am in Colorado. Okay. And I, I got thermal underwear on all the time lately. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Well, thank you again for you know joining us and making the time and i will definitely put your website and instagram down in the show notes so people can find that um but i do always like to give guests the last word before we sign out in case there's anything i didn't ask that you wanted to mention or just you wanted to shout out your dog or cheetos or anything <laughs> like that so for the closing moments the floor is yours uh, first of all, of course, thank you for having me, man. Uh, we've been working on getting me on this show for a little while. A lot of people have asked me to come on. You've asked me a couple times. Thanks for being patient with me. Thanks for having me. I had a lot of fun, man. We, uh, we got silly. We became uh, better friends. Uh, we relaxed and had a good time. So thank you. Uh, thanks to the new audience, all the people that are going to hang out with uh, me on Discord coming from your show. Thank you to you guys. Uh, thanks for all the support. This has been a great year in 2023. I had a huge struggle and came out better than ever. So that was super awesome. Could not have done it without the entire Irie army. Uh, if you're close to me and sit in the house with me, or if you're way out there on internet land, you had a small part to do with it. Uh, the party would not have been the same without your presence. So thank each and every one of you for the support in 2023. We're going to kill it in 2024. This just suddenly sounded like I'm doing some political campaign. So we're going to get back to weed. Um, smoke them if you got them and take a fat dab and give your mom a hug for me. Heck yeah. What a way to close it. That's got to be one of the best we've ever had. So well, I you. do appreciate it. Yeah. I appreciate that. Everybody tuning in. Thank you. There will definitely be more to come in the future. So keep it locked here. Uh, Chad Westport YouTube channel. And don't forget to go check out the grow from your heart podcast right now. Done. Over there. Subscribe. All right. Like. We'll catch you guys later. See ya. Peace guys. All right. Bro, that was a great show. You did a good job, man. Thank you for allowing me to just enjoy myself. A little, yeah. not gonna lie, a little bit nervous. Uh, oh, love, no, dude. Love just, your yeah. head, so. it's normal. I woke up and pooped this morning just like you, bro. <laughs> <laughs> That's the best time to do it. Um, right.